Hold My name is Gary Baller. I'm the president of Don Farm. On behalf of Don Farm, I want to welcome you. Uh, tonight's program is Barking to the Choir, The Power of Radical Kinship, presented by Father Gregory Boyle. Greg Boyle is the founder of Homeboy Industries in Los Angeles, the largest gang intervention, rehabilitation, and reentry program in the world. Uh, he's the author of two best-selling books that I and the Dawn Farm staff all love, uh, and quote commonly, uh, Tattoos on the Heart, The Power of Boundless Compassion, and Barking to the Choir, The Power of Radical Kinship. Please join me in welcoming Greg Boyle. Thank you. It's a privilege uh, to be with you. And thank you, Jim, and, and thank you, Don Farm. I have a great admirer of, uh, of all that you do. Uh, it's the privilege of my life for uh, uh, 31 years to work at Homeboy Industries and to have my heart altered uh, by thousands and thousands of men and women who uh, the day won't ever come when I have more courage or I am more noble or I'm closer to God than they are. Uh, people like Louis Perez, who was kind of a, uh, a force of nature at, at Homeboy, he worked there for about 10 years, he was a gang member, out of prison, heroin addict, uh, uh, force of nature. He also is a good speaker. He would. Um, be in demand. People, high schools and stuff, would ask for him by name, and he liked speaking. And uh, we went out to dinner, and he was giving me tips on how to speak publicly. <laughs> and he said, "You know, you gotta pepper your talk with self-defecating humor." <laughs> and I said, "Yeah, no shit." Uh, <laughs> That's some good advice there, so brace yourselves. Um, you know, I've been to Ann Arbor before. You know, I spoke at, uh, at the university here and uh, several times, I guess, over the years. Um, but uh, Jim's an old friend, and I'm, I'm happy to, to oblige this uh, speaker series. You know, uh, the other day I was sitting in my office with four homies, and one of them, a guy named Jose, was... Uh, he was uh, looking at his cell phone and he said, uh, uh, you know, my wife just texted me. What does LMAO stand for? <laughs> and I couldn't believe that this old ass geezer was going to tell this homie that it stands for laugh my ass off. But in fairness to him, you know, he had been locked up for so long that, uh, uh, you know, he didn't really know the the cell phone thing. And uh, he was saying, um, I barely found out last week that LOL does not stand for lots of love. <laughs> so then he was telling me that his 14-year-old daughter um, had texted him and said, Dad, we won the basketball game. And uh, Jose texts her back, WTF. And she thinks, what? And a couple days later, she says, I passed that math test, the one I was so worried about. And again, WTF. <laughs> so she sees him the next day, and she goes, Dad, do you know what WTF stands for? And, and he says, of course I do. Why, that's fantastic. <laughs> So, uh, I'm really happy to be with you and words fail me, so uh, <laughs> WTF. <laughs> I think the reason you're here uh, tonight has very little to do with me. It has more to do with uh, what you would like to imagine in the world. Uh, Mother Teresa diagnosed the world's ills correctly when she suggested that the problem in the world is that We've just forgotten that we belong to each other, so how do we stand against forgetting that? How do we galvanize the imagination in this room to 
imagine a circle of compassion and then imagine nobody standing outside that circle. How do we together dismantle the barriers that exclude? And to that end, uh, you know, people will say, like even the Pope and others, you know, we, we, in order to do this, we have to go to the margins. Because if we go to the margins and we stand there, our margins get erased because of where we chose to place ourselves. And we stand with a certain particularity with the poor and the powerless and the voiceless. And we stand with those whose dignity has been denied. And we stand with those whose burdens are more than they can bear. And every once in a while we get this exquisite privilege, this ability to stand with the easily despised and the readily left out. We get to stand with the demonized so that the demonizing will stop. And we get to stand with the disposable so that the day will come when we stop throwing people away. And I suspect if in our imagining we create a community of kinship such that God in fact might recognize it, we will no longer be uh, working and struggling and promoting justice, we'd be celebrating it. No kinship, no peace. No kinship, no justice. No kinship, no equality. I think no matter how singularly focused we may well be on those worthy goals, the truth of the matter is they can't actually happen unless there's some undergirding sense that we belong to each other and that we have in fact stood against forgetting that. And so we brace ourselves as we go to the margins because people will accuse you of wasting your time. But the prophet Jeremiah writes, in this place of which you say it is a waste, there will be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness the voices of those who sing. And you go from this auditorium tonight to the margins and other voices get heard. Um, none of this makes any sense to me uh, were it not for kind of a notion of what kind of God we have. So if you'll permit me to, to do a little parenthetical about that. Um, I'm a, a Jesuit, so uh, Ignatius always talked about the God who's always greater, and, and uh, people in recovery uh, talk about the higher power, and the higher power is about a spacious, expansive sense of things. The problem is we've sort of settled for a puny notion of, of who God might be. I had a spiritual director years ago who said, you know, we need a better God than the one we have. <laughs> he was a Jesuit. Uh, and, of course, he's right, because uh, we settled for a partial and a puny God. Uh, I think we can all uh, sort of uh, connect to this notion. You know, when, uh, when Dylan Roof killed all those folks in, the, in Mother Emanuel Church, and I don't think a week had passed when family members of those who had died stood in front of him and said, we forgive you. I suspect understanding uh, the weight of mental illness. Everybody who heard that knew that you were in the presence of the God we actually have. But nine months later, when he was sentenced to die and people called it God's justice. You knew you had wandered back to the partial God, the lesser God, the puny God. Meister Eckhart, uh, the great mystic and theologian, uh, said, it is a lie, any talk of God that doesn't comfort you. I think that's quite right, and I also think that nobody believes it because we kind of long for this 
partial God who asks us to measure up. The homies have always kind of uh, stretched my mind and my heart to kind of see things more expansively. Oftentimes they do it by way of uh, mangling the English language, uh, which I always find charming and illuminating. I had a homegirl named Lisa, a gang member who's one of our uh, 18-month trainees, and uh, at the end of the day, her man came to pick her up, so she wanted uh, to introduce him to me, and she brought him into my office, and she says, this is my sufficient other. No doubt. <laughs> Jim and I were talking about, uh, you know, kind of succession plan at, at Homeboy. And I said, well, I kind of don't run the place now. I have a CEO, which I'm really grateful for, a great guy who, who uh, has to worry about our meeting payroll and uh, head count and cash flow. And so I don't have to. I can be here. And uh, so I had a homie come into my office and... He was kind of uh, distressed, and one of our trainees, a gang member, and he said, damn, G, my lady, she is in a bad mood today. And I said, why? Well, you know, she's beginning her <laughs> administration period. <laughs> I said, well, I just finished mine, so <laughs> kind of know what she's going through. Uh, but my favorite one happened when I was presiding at San Fernando Juvenile Hall, and it was, it was in those days it was a big old gym, and we had 500 gang members in there, uh, maybe a row of females, but the rest guys. And, uh, and so I had my Albon and my stole, and I was, uh, they have these sheets that have the readings in English and in Spanish, and I thought, well, I'm going to close the sheet and have it rest on my lap. I'm going to close my eyes. I'm going to listen to the word proclaimed. So the homies got up, the first guy did the first reading, and then the second guy got up and, and did the psalm response, and there was a kind of an overabundance of confidence in his voice, and he got up and he said, the Lord is exhausted. <laughs> and I said, what the hell? <laughs> and it was, the Lord is exalted. And I remember thinking at the time, wow, that's way better. <laughs> I mean, let's be honest, you know, the, um, you know, the exalted God really is the God created in our own image. Because, you know, if we were uh, a God, we would want to be exalted. Uh, that's sort of the projection. That's the way it works. Uh, my friend Anne Lamott always says that you know you've created God in your own image when God hates the same people you do. <laughs> so you don't want to settle for that puny God. You know, the exhausted God is kind of expansive and generous. And no, it's not about me, it's about you. And that has great appeal. And that is a better God than the one we have. Not all that long ago, I buried my uh, 92-year-old mama, and she had eight kids, and five girls and three boys, and I buried my dad 25 years ago. But she died in her own home, and uh, in her own bed, surrounded by her kids, and she was sharp as a tack to the very end. In fact, in the last months of her life, she watched so much MSNBC she was becoming Rachel Maddow. <laughs> and she was not one lick afraid of dying. You know, in fact, a couple weeks before she died, she said to me, I've never done this before. <laughs> you know, which was something you might say just prior to skydiving, you know. And in fact, her last words to me were the day before she died. I, I just happened to be there by myself, which rarely happened. It was just one of us. And and uh, she was asleep, and when she woke up, she saw me, and she said, Oh, for crying out loud. <laughs> and she went back to sleep. Well, she was pissed off that she was not dead yet, you know. <laughs> Sorry. 
And then as luck would have it, I, I happened to be there at the exact moment she died. It was the next day, and it was at noon, and a bunch of my sisters went out to go rustle up lunch, and I was sitting there, and she opened her eyes, and she let out this wondrous, glorious gasp. <gasps> Skydiving. And nobody in earshot of the sound could ever be afraid of death again. But I tell you that because in the last uh, days of her life, and when it would be two of us or three of us or all eight of us uh, standing around her bed, she'd be asleep and she'd wake up and then she'd lock on to one of us and with breathless delight, she'd say, Oh, you're here. You're here. And after I buried her, I thought, well, now that's the entire agenda of our exhausted God. It's the tender glance, and we receive the tender glance, and, and we feel compelled to be that tender glance in the world, and I think that's the whole thing. Behold the one beholding you and smiling, and it is a lie, any talk of God that doesn't comfort us. It is the exhausted God who doesn't want anything from us, only wants for us. And once you know that, it's a game changer. There is nothing more consequential in our lives than having an expansive, spacious notion of this God who loves us without measure and without regret, who only wants to look at you with breathless delight and say, you're here, you're here. Even as we finished Lent, you know, I was thinking, uh, you know, it's 40 days that kind of models the desert and Jesus, and we all, we kind of project all these things onto that, you know, grim duty and grumbling stomach and eating locusts, I don't know what the hell, and... <laughs> And maybe he's regretting he gave up scotch and chocolate for Lent, you know. And, and, and yet it's not dark night of the soul. It's just God saying, you're here. You're here. And then you don't know what else to say to that except, well, you're here. <laughs> and that's it. And then it's exquisitely mutual. And then you're, you're just greeting people and everybody gets to inhabit their unshakable goodness and their primal nobility. Or as a great many Buddhist texts begin, O nobly born, remember who you really are. And when you can receive the tender glance and hear that voice, then you go to the margins because that's where the joy is. And all you want to do is look in eyes and say, you're here, you're here. But kinship is the goal. That's God's dream come true, that you may be one, as Jesus says. And I know we begin with service, and service is a good place to begin. Service is the hallway that gets you to the ballroom, but you want to get to the ballroom, which is the place of exquisite mutuality and connection with each other, where everybody's extending this tender glance. That's where you want to go. Otherwise, there's distance in service, and there are a lot of service providers in this, off, in this audience, and, and, and you don't want that either. You know, service provider, service recipient. There's a gulf. Uh, I was speaking in Houston in a, 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 what we would call in the biz a hardcore gang intervention worker, a guy who works in the streets of Houston, really good guy, former gang member himself and former inmate. And he pleaded with me and he said, uh, how do you reach them, meaning gang members? And I said, well, for starters, stop trying to reach them. Can you be reached by them? And that just turns everything on its head. It turns service on its head. It, it ushers in a whole new way of being where everybody can 
inhabit the same thing since we're all born wanting the same things. One of the great privileges of my life was knowing Cesar Chavez as a friend and he was like absolutely the best listener I've ever been in the presence of. If you were talking to Cesar, nobody else existed. He was laser beam focused. He was never looking over your shoulder to see if somebody more important was on the approach. His whole being seemed to say, you're here. But once famously a reporter had commented to him and said, wow, these farm workers, they sure love you. And Cesar just shrugged and smiled and said, the feeling's mutual which of course is the hope. How do we arrive at that place where there is no daylight that separates us, where there is no us and them, there's just us? Well, no homie found more job opportunities in our entire history than this guy we all called Dreamer. And I knew him since he was a little mocosito growing up in the housing projects, and his older brothers were from a gang, and. Uh, one of the smartest homies I've ever known, though I'm not sure he ever actually went to school ever, but he was very smart with a dangerous sense of humor. He's doing fine now. He's in his early 40s, married, good job, kids, house. But uh, in his early 20s, he was a kind of a yo-yo, in and out of getting locked up all the time. And, and uh, I'd find him a job in the private sector or in one of our nine social enterprises. And always, de volada, quickly, he'd, he'd find himself uh, gravitating uh, to vague criminality, you know, usually something involving drugs, the sale of or the use of. And then he'd wander back to me, and this was a pattern that repeated itself quite a bit, and, um, and it was getting frustrating. And, so this one time he finished a four month uh, stretch, a probation violation at the county jail. And there he is sitting in front of my desk and he says what gang members often say, this time it'll be different. And I go, mm, all right. So with him sitting there, I, I call a friend of mine who runs a vending machine company in Alhambra, California, and a guy named Gary who had hired homies in the past. So I'm thinking maybe he'll do it again. And, Sure enough, uh, he says, you tell that guy he can start tomorrow. That's a holy man right there. So Dreamer began work the next day in the vending machine company. Well, two weeks later, there he is again in front of my desk. I couldn't believe my eyeballs. I said, híjole madre santa, here we go all over again. But this time he pulls out of his pocket his very first paycheck, and he waves it proudly, and he says, damn, gee, this paycheck makes me feel proper. I mean, my mom, she's proud of me, and my kids, they're not ashamed of me. And you know who I have to thank for this job. And I said, well... <laughs> who? <laughs> and he looked at me strangely, and he said, well... God, of course. I, oh, sure, no. That's, <laughs> that's right. That, that would be God. He said, you thought I was going to say you. I said, no, gosh, God's, <laughs> God's number one. He said, you are so lucky. We're not living in them Genesis days. I'm sorry, them Genesis days? He goes, yeah, because God would have been had struck down your ass already by now. <laughs> well, the, the thing I most remember was the two of us, we just fell out of our chairs howling with laughter, and I defy you to identify exactly who's the service provider and who's the service recipient. It's mutual. The homies have taught me everything of value, but, uh, but certainly they've taught me about kinship. And along with that, they've taught me how to text, so I'm really grateful to them because I find it sure beats the heck out of actually talking to people. And, <laughs> and, uh, and you know, I, I can't be alone in being vexed by this uh, autocorrect thing, you know. Um, 
you know, they just, uh, a homegirl named Bertha, she texted me on a Sunday and she said, where are you at? And I said, I am about to speak to a room full of monjas. And uh, monjas means sisters, nuns, religious women in Spanish. I'm about to speak to a room full of monjas and I pushed send. Autocorrect told her I was about to speak to a room full of ninjas. <laughs> which she thought was pretty darn interesting. <laughs> Even now, I mean, my God, every two minutes, their homie's hair is on fire. You know, this bill or my car note or rent, it's always rent, and, and the, tomorrow's May 1, so I have like 49 of those. And, and once a homie wrote me, and he just needed $100 to finish off his rent. Well, I didn't have it. So I wrote back simply, things are tight. And I pushed send and autocorrect told him, thongs are tight. <laughs> and he wrote back, sorry to hear that. <laughs> um, uh, what, uh, what about my rent? But I, I'm pretty dexterous at it, you know, LOL and OMG and BTW, and the homies have taught me a new one, OHN, which apparently stands for, oh, hell no. <laughs> and I've been using that one quite a bit lately. <laughs> so there I am in a car with two older vatos, Manuel and Poncho, and at about 9 o'clock in the morning, at 10 minutes to 9, we always have our morning meeting where we have the thought for the day and the prayer and announcements and... People share things, you know, like I got my kids back, or uh, I'm one year sober, or whatever it is. We sing happy birthday, whether it's your birthday or not. And, and so I'm in the car with Manuel and Poncho, and we're going to drive, and they're going to help me give a talk at a uh, uh, high school in Palm Desert. And we're 15 minutes on the road when Manuel in the front seat gets a, a text, and he chuckles. And I say, what is it? Oh, it's dumb. It's from Snoopy back at the office. Well, I'd just seen Snoopy. Snoopy just gave me a big old abrazo. Snoopy and Manuel work together in the clock-in room where they clock in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of our workers, all gang members. I would not want this job because this may come as a shock. Um, gang members can sometimes be attitudinal. <laughs> so I said, what... Uh, what do you say? Oh, it's dumb. Hang on, let me find it here. Here it is. Hey, dog, it's me, Snoops. Yeah, they got my ass locked up at county jail. They're charging me with being the ugliest vato in America. <laughs> you have to come down right now, show them they got the wrong guy. <laughs> Well, I nearly drove into oncoming traffic. We laughed so damn hard in. And then I realized that Manuel and Snoopy are enemies. They're from rival gangs. They used to shoot bullets at each other. And now they shoot text messages. And there's a word for that, and the word is kinship. How do we obliterate once and for all the illusion that we are separate, that there is an us and a them? So, oh boy, it was started a long time ago, 1988, when I was pastor of the poorest parish in the city of Los Angeles called Dolores Mission. And it was nestled right in the middle of two public housing projects, Pico Gardens and Aliso Village. At the time, it was the largest grouping of public housing west of the Mississippi. We had eight gangs at war with each other, which is not typical of public housing. Usually you have one or so. Um, making it, according to the LAPD, the place of the highest concentration of gang activity in Los Angeles. So if LA was, is the gang capital of the world, my parish uh, was the gang capital of Los Angeles. There are 120,000 gang members in LA County and uh, 1,100 gangs. <clears throat> so I buried my first young person killed because of this sadness in 1988. And I buried my 227th uh, three months ago. Not all from that community, of course, but I run a large gang intervention program. I get asked to do this. 
So the first thing we did was we started a school because there were so many middle school, junior high age gang members who had been given the boot from their home school. Nobody wanted them. So in the middle of the day, they were just wreaking havoc uh, in the projects. They were writing on walls, they were selling drugs, they were uh, violent. So I, I walked out to them and I would isolate them kind of one at a time. I'd say, hey, you know, if I found a school, that would take you, would you go? And to my surprise, every single one said, yeah, you know, I would. And then I couldn't find a school that would take them. You know, that sort of forced my hand a little bit. So right across the street from the church is our parochial school, grades K to 8, occupying the first two floors. But the entire third floor was the convent where the ninjas lived. And... Uh, <laughs> So I gathered all the sisters together in the living room one evening, and I sat them down and I said, hey, you know, would you guys mind, you know, moving out? And, uh, <laughs> and we could turn the convent into, you know, like a school for gang members. And they looked at each other and they said, sure. And that was uh, the entirety of their discernment process. And so then that brought gang members in large numbers to our church property, and uh, which kind of created something of a disconnect. Parishioners started to come to me and say, wait a minute, um, aren't churches supposed to be hermetically sealed? You know, good people in and bad people out. So I thought that was a good gospel challenge. And then the gang member said, if only we had jobs. And so myself and the women in the parish, uh, the profile of folks who live in the parish were women with children, not that many men around. So myself and the women, we marched around the factories that surrounded uh, the housing projects, trying to find felony-friendly employers. And that wasn't so forthcoming. So um, we invented things. you know. Uh, a maintenance crew and a landscaping crew and a crew to build our child care center on the church property, all made up of rival uh, gang members from the eight gangs. And then in 1992, after the unrest that followed the Rodney King verdict, uh, the entire city of Los Angeles just imploded. Every pocket of poverty ignited, except the poorest pocket of my parish. And so the LA Times came snooping around and asked me, why do you think this community didn't ignite? And I, and I said, well, I think it's because we had 60 strategically hired rival enemy gang members who had a reason to get up in the morning and a reason not to gangbang the night before and more to the point of your question, a reason not to torch their own community. So the next day, the article appeared, and a movie producer named Ray Stark, who happened to have $500 million, <laughs> read the article, and he summoned me to his office in Beverly Hills, and he said, how do you think I should spend my money? As I look back on it now, I see that I woefully undershot my request. <laughs> I was young. So... Um, I said, well, there's an abandoned tore-up bakery. It has ovens. The ovens don't work, but we could fix them. I, we could throw paint on the place. We could put hairnets on rival enemy gang members. We could, I don't know, they could bake bread. And we could call it Homeboy Bakery. And that was the extent of my business plan. And he said, sure. And so we were off and running. A month later, we started Homeboy Tortillas in the Grand Central Market. Once we had plural, we changed our name from Jobs for a Future to Homeboy Industries, as if there was any industry involved in this venture. And not everything worked. I'll be the first to admit it. Homeboy Plumbing really was not hugely successful. <laughs> Who knew? Uh, people didn't want gang members in their homes. I, I did not see that coming. <laughs> and nobody ever intends to do such a thing. You evolve, you back your way into becoming uh, the, the largest gang intervention rehab reentry program on the planet. We didn't intend to do that, but it sort of happened. 
So 15,000 folks a year walk through our doors at Homeboy wanting to reimagine their lives. Most of them want to get in on our 18-month training program because it's a, a paid gig, but it's also where the healing happens. We used to be job-centric, but now we're, we're healing-centered because an employed gang member or returning citizen may or may not go back to prison. And an educated one may or may not, but it is our absolute total guarantee that a healed person won't ever reoffend. And so it's about receiving them. And if you will, we, we are something of a sanctuary where they can uh, find respite from their chronic toxic stress. And then they become the sanctuary that they sought. And then they go home and present to their kids this same sanctuary and suddenly you've broken a cycle. And then they re-identify who they are in the world and then they discover a newfound resilience, so nobly born, remember who you are. And then they leave us after 18 months and the world will throw at them what it will, but this time they won't be toppled. So uh, we have four paid therapists, but 47 volunteer therapists, including two psychiatrists. So everybody's in therapy. We have group stuff. We have so many 12-step things, NAAA. We also have CGA, which is Criminals and Gangs Anonymous, for gang members who found themselves more addicted to the adrenaline rush than to any uh, substance. Uh, free tattoo removal, no place on the, on the planet Earth. Uh, removes more tattoos than we do. We have a designated clinic, three laser machines, 11,000 treatments a year. Uh, we have one paid physician assistant and uh, 43 volunteer doctors. So if anybody <coughs> is starting to regret that Dawn Farm uh, tattoo you have, uh, <laughs> see, me, see me afterwards. Jim. Um, and it was all started because of a guy named Frank who I didn't know and he wandered into my office two days out of Corcoran State Prison and he's sitting in front of my, my desk and tattooed on his forehead like a big old damn billboard filling the whole space with big block black letters that it said fuck the world and he looked at me and he said you know I am having a hard time finding a job. <laughs> I said, well, Frank, maybe we could put our heads together on this one. You know? And I'm not sure exactly where I can send this guy, you know, to, to McDonald's. You know, Do you want fries with that? No, I don't want fries. <laughs> Mothers clutching their kids and running out of the store. So naturally, I hired him, and he bagged bread for a time, and... Uh, and I went looking for a doc, and I found a dermatologist with a laser machine at uh, White Memorial Hospital. And he donated one hour a month to chip away at Frank's forehead and uh, like five others. And in no time at all, I had a waiting list of 3,000 gang members who wanted this same uh, uh, treatment, so we couldn't really stay with that arrangement. <laughs> So, parentheses, Frank is currently a, a security guard at a movie studio in Hollywood, and there is no trace left of the angriest, dumbest thing he'd ever done. <laughs> Proving once and for all that indeed everyone in this auditorium and everybody outside of it is a whole lot more than the worst things we've ever done. And then we have all our nine uh, social enterprises, Homeboy Bakery, Homeboy Silkscreen, Homeboy Diner, which is the only place you can get food at City Hall. We have a restaurant at Terminal 4, LAX International Airport. Uh, we have farmer's markets. We have a thing called Homeboy Grocery, where we sell chips, salsas, and guacamole, and a bunch of chains, uh, grocery stores on the West Coast, and on Stop and Shop uh, on the East Coast. Um, uh, Homeboy Merchandise. Homeboy Home Girl merchandise, where we sell our logo stuff. Uh, Homeboy Recycling, which is becoming quite a successful operation. Homeboy uh, Solar Panel Installation Program. 
where we nationally certify homies to install uh, solar panels. And Homegirl Cafe, where women with records, young ladies from rival gangs, waitresses with attitude, will gladly take your order. <laughs> and they cater. If you go there, you'll, you'll run into all sorts of celebs, a lot of celeb sightings. Uh, um, Jim Carrey goes there a fair amount, and Jack Black, and Forrest Whitaker, and, and once with... Uh, uh, only two hours' notice from the Secret Service, Vice President Joe Biden uh, came when he was Vice President, and uh, motorcade, entourage, selfies with Uncle Joe. He was quite affectionate with the homies. They didn't seem to mind. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not plugging a candidate here. So. I was making my annual silent eight-day retreat, so I wasn't there. So when I came back, I ran into Louis Mora, and he said, Damn, gee, while you were gone, we were visited by an MVP. <laughs> MVP? Do, do you mean a VIP? That one, VIP, yeah. <laughs> Imagine, gee, here at Homeboy Industries, we were visited by the Vice President of the United States, Mick Romney. And I think you can file that under all white guys seem to look alike. <laughs> and I think we did add a, a current affairs class shortly thereafter. But, <laughs> uh, but most famously of all, uh, Diane Keaton showed up, Oscar winner, movie star, Godfather movies, Annie Hall. And her waitress was Glenda. And Glenda's a big girl. Been there, done that, tattooed, felon, parolee. Um, she has no idea who Diane Keaton is, and so she's taking her order, and Diane Keaton says, well, what do you recommend? And Glinda rattles off the three dishes she particularly likes, and, and Diane Keaton says, well, I'll have that second one. That one sounds good. And it's at that moment, for some reason, something dawns on Glinda, and she looks at Diane Keaton, she says, wait a minute. I feel like I know you from somewhere. You know, like maybe we've met. And Diane Keaton decides to deflect it humbly. Oh, gosh, I, I don't know, I suppose I have one of those faces that people think they've seen before. And then Glenda goes, no, now I know. We were locked up together. <laughs> <clears throat> Honest to God, that took my breath away when I heard it. And, uh, I don't believe we've had any further Diane Keaton sightings now that I think of it. <laughs> and suddenly kinship so quickly, Oscar-winning actress, attitudinal waitress, exactly what God had in mind, that you may be one. What Martin Luther King says about church could well be said about our time together here in this evening. It, it, it's not, it's not, the place you've come to, it's the place you go from, and you go from here to be enlightened witnesses, people who through your kindness and tenderness and focused, attentive love, return people to themselves. At Homeboy, we're allergic to the notion of holding the bar up and asking people to measure up, mainly because our exhausted God doesn't do this. Instead, we hold the mirror up and we say, you're here. And we tell people the truth. It's the same truth we all share. That you all happen to be exactly what God had in mind when God made you. And then once folks, especially those on the margins, know that truth, they become that truth, they inhabit that truth, and no bullet can pierce it, no four prison walls can keep it out, and death can't touch it because it's huge. But at Homeboy, we know that you have to reach in and dismantle the messages of shame and disgrace that get in the way that keep people from seeing their truth. Marcus Borg, the great scripture scholar, said that the principal suffering of the poor throughout history and throughout scripture was shame and disgrace, and I think that's quite right. 
In the Acts of the Apostles, it has this very odd line that kind of leaps out at you, and it says simply, and awe came upon everyone. And it seems to suggest that the measure of health in any community at all, including this one here, may well reside in our ability to stand in awe at what the poor have to carry, rather than stand in judgment at how they carry it. So uh, some years ago I was invited to speak to 600 social workers in Richmond, Virginia. And uh, it was one of those things they called the ga a gang in service. So it was, you know, you get, you know, CE credits and, and you, uh, it's nine to five in a hotel ballroom and a lot of workshops and plenary sessions all about gangs. So I said yes, figuring I'd, I'd uh, you know, maybe give a keynote or speak at lunch or close the day, something like that. So I said yes, and I bought my ticket. Well, a week before I was to fly, I pulled the original invitation letter out, and to my horror, I discovered that I was to be the only speaker all damn day nine to five. <laughs> and I said to myself, oh, hell no. And so I invited two trainees in, gang members, homies, Andre and Jose, and I, I, they were like in their ninth month of our 18-month program, so midway, and I sat them down. I said, look, at the end of the week, you're flying with me to Richmond, Virginia. I'd like you to get up in front of 600 social workers. I'd like you to tell your stories. Take your time. <laughs> because we got a long ass day to fill. <laughs> well, I'd never heard their stories and Jose gets up first and he's 25 years old, gang member, been to prison, tattooed, felon. Uh, but in his, the different phases, everybody goes through different phases at, at Homeboy and he, he was in a phase where he was doing kind of clerical stuff but he was attached as a very valued member of our substance abuse team, a man solid in his own recovery and now he's helping uh, homies and homegirls with their addiction issues. You know, man who was in prison for a stretch, but also had a long stretch as a homeless man and an even longer stretch as a heroin addict. And so he gets up in front of 600 social workers and he says, I guess you could say my mom and me, we didn't get along so good. I think I was six when she looked at me and she said, why don't you just kill yourself? You're such a burden to me. Well, 600 social workers audibly gasp, and, and then he says, it, it sounds way worser in Spanish. <laughs> and we got friggin' whiplash going from gasp to laugh. Then he continued, I, I think I was nine when my mom drove me down to the deepest part of Baja California and she walks me up to an orphanage and she knocks on the door and the guy comes to the door and she says, I found this kid and she left me there for 90 days until my grandmother could get out of her where she had dumped me and my grandmother came and rescued me. My mom beat me every single day of my elementary school years with things you could imagine and a lot of things you couldn't. Every day my back was bloodied and scarred. In fact, I had to wear three t-shirts to school each day. First t-shirt because the blood would seep through. And second t-shirt you could still see it. Finally, the third t-shirt, you couldn't see any blood. The kids said, school, they make fun of me. Hey, fool, it's 100 degrees. Why are you wearing three t-shirts? And then he stopped speaking, so overwhelmed with emotion, and he seemed to be staring at a piece of his story that only he could see. And when he could regain his speech, he said through his tears, I wore three t-shirts 
well into my adult years because I was ashamed of my wounds. I didn't want anybody to see them. But now I welcome my wounds. I run my fingers over my scars. My wounds are my friends. After all, how can I help heal the wounded if I don't welcome my own wounds? And awe came upon everyone. The measure of our compassion lies not in our service of those on the margins, but only in our willingness to see ourselves in kinship with them. For the truth of the matter is this, if we don't welcome our own wounds, we may well be tempted to despise the wounded. In the original covenantal relationship, God says to God's people, as I have loved you, so must you have a special preferential care and love for the widow, orphan, and the stranger. And that's because God thinks these are the folks who know what it's like to have been cut off. And because they have suffered in this particular way, God thinks these happen to be our trustworthy guides to lead the rest of us to the kinship of God. So you don't go to the margins to make a difference because then it's about you. You go to the margins so that the folks at the margins make you different. And then it's about us. I was being interviewed by this nice lady on the Christian Broadcast Network and she was asking me about all that we do at Homeboy and, and I gave her the list of all the things I told you and I went on at some length and talked about how home, Homeboy wants to be what the world is invited to become that hope has an address and we want to be the front porch of a world that we all long for and I went on and on and on and when I finished my litany of things we do at Homeboy, she kind of made a face. And then she said, yeah, but how much time each day do you spend at Homeboy? You know, praising God. And I didn't know what to say to that. And so I said, all damn day. And I don't think she liked that answer very much. <laughs> but it begs this question, and I'll end with one last story. It begs the question, what, what kind of praise does our exhausted God have any interest in? And so it occurs sometimes to universities to force their students to read my books against their will. <laughs> I'm not complaining, but uh, so my alma mater, Gonzaga University, who ruined my bracket, <laughs> uh, they forced the freshman class to read Tattoos on the Heart, so they called me and said, we're going to have a big Tuesday night thing and a venue of, with a thousand people, will you come? I said, sure, and they said, can you bring two homies with you? And and I do if people are going to pay for it, and if it's not a multiple city uh, stint like I'm currently on. And uh, I always pick homies the same way. I always pick rivals, enemies uh, among our trainees just to force them to share the same hotel room, just to mess with them. And, <laughs> and I always pick homies who have never flown before just for the thrill. <laughs> of seeing gang members panicked in the sky. 
<laughs> a number of years ago, we were at LAX with two older Vatos, and uh, one of them, dead serious, said to me, Hey, G, are we flying Virgin Airlines because it's our first time? <laughs> I said, well, yes, actually, it's a requirement. Um, we'll, we'll be coming home on American, so... <laughs> So I picked two homies, uh, Bobby, an African-American gang member who worked in uh, the bakery, and Mario, <coughs> who worked in our merchandise store at the time. And I've done this so many times, thousands probably, with men and women. I I've never picked anybody more absolutely petrified, terrified of flying than this guy Mario. It was actually starting to freak me out a little bit, you know. I mean, he was hyperventilating, you know, like, ah, 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 and we hadn't even you know, boarded the plane yet. And so we're at Burbank Airport, which is kind of a smaller airport, big bay windows and uh, Southwest Airlines mainly. And um, you don't enter that hermetically sealed chute to board the plane. You walk out onto the tarmac like you're the president and you <laughs> climb up the steps to get to the front of the plane. And the big feature at Burbank are the steps that go to the back of the plane. So I'm sitting there with Mario, and Bobby's off walking somewhere in the airport, and our plane arrives, it's early morning, and, and people are deplaning. And, and I, I said, Mario, that's, that's going to be our plane. <laughs> and I think, oh my God, he may die before we actually climb those stairs, you know. And so, um, and then I see our flight crew, the pilots, and there were two f uh, female flight attendants, and both of them had very large cups of Starbucks coffee and they're schlepping up the steps to board the plane. And, and Mario goes, when are we going to board the plane? I said, well, as soon as they sober up the pilots. <laughs> <laughs> there, there they go now. <laughs> Perhaps I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> so I should tell you that in our 31-year history at Homeboy Industries, Mario is the most tattooed individual who's ever worked there, which, trust me, is saying a great deal. And he's all sleeved out, his whole arms are covered in tattoos, head shaved, covered in tattoos, forehead, cheeks, chin, eyelids that say the end, so that when he's lying in his coffin, there will be no doubt. <laughs> And so I'm trying to calm him down. I'd never been in public with him. And as I'm walking him through the airport, people are like this, you know, and mothers are clutching their kids a little more closely. I'm thinking, wow, isn't that interesting? Because if you were to go tomorrow to Homeboy Industries, just walk in there and quick say to anybody who works there, quick, who's the kindest, most gentle soul who works here? They won't say me. They'll think for half a second, they'll say Mario. Mario uh, is a waiter now in, in our cafe. Mario is proof that only the soul that ventilates the world with tenderness has any chance of changing the world. Mario is proof that tenderness is the highest form of spiritual maturity. So we get to Spokane, and of course this always happens, you know, the big talk Tuesday night. What they don't tell you is all damn day Tuesday, they got 93 other talks for you, you know. Lunch, talk, meeting, class, 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 all damn day. So I tell Mario and Bobby, I'm not going to speak at any of these. I want you guys to get up, and, uh, and I'm going to sit in the back of the classroom. So they get up, and... They're terrified, especially Mario, but they do a good job. Stories of terror and torture and violence and abuse of every imaginable kind. And honest to God, if their stories had been flames, you'd have to keep your distance. Otherwise, you'd get scorched. I would not have survived a single day of either of their childhoods. So the nighttime talk came, and uh, I get them up before me in front of a thousand people, and they were terrified, again, especially Mario. Yeah, but they, was, they each did a seven-minute snapshot, so that I could include them at the end in the question and answer. So after they were done, I got up and did my thing. 
And then I pulled him up on the stage and, uh, yeah, questions. Yes, ma'am. And a woman stands and she goes, yeah, I got a question. It's for Mario. First question out the gate. And Mario is this tall, skinny drink of water and he clutches the microphone and he's just terrified. Yes? And she says, well, you say you're a father and you have a son and a daughter who are about to enter their teenage years. What wisdom do you impart to them? You know, what advice do you give them? And Mario closes his eyes and again he clutches the microphone. He's starting to tremble and he's getting a friggin' hernia trying to come up with whatever the hell he's going to say. And when suddenly he blurts out, I just... As soon as he says those two words, he rushes back to his microphone clutching closed-eyed refuge. And now I know he's losing his battle with tears. But he wants to get the whole sentence out. I, I just don't want my kids to turn out to be like me. And there's silence. Until the woman who asked the question stands and now it's her turn to cry. Why wouldn't you want your kids to turn out to be like you? You are loving, you are kind, you are gentle, you are wise. I hope your kids turn out to be like you. And a thousand total perfect strangers stand and they will not stop clapping. And all Mario can do is hold his face in his hand so overwhelmed that this room full of strangers had returned him to himself. But let there be no doubt, everybody standing also returned to themselves, which shouldn't surprise us because it's mutual. Everybody looking at each other and saying in unison, O oh, nobly born, remember who you really are. You're here. You're here. And I think that's the only praise our exhausted God has any interest in. This auditorium is not the place you've come to. It is the place you go from. And you go from here to imagine a circle of compassion and then imagine nobody standing outside of it. You go from here to dismantle the barriers that exclude. And my sense of you already is that you long ago you ceased to care whether anyone accuses you of wasting your time. For in this place of which you say it is a waste, there will be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voices of those who sing. We don't go to the margins to make a difference. We go to the margins so that the widow, orphan, and stranger make us different. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We're going to... Thanks. Uh, thank you. We're going to just do a Q&A. And I, I never do the microphone. I never say come up and speak. I never run the microphone out to you. You just go like this. Even back there. And we'll be able to pass the thing along. And I'll uh, repeat the question if you're timid. Uh, and, you know, any question, 
will issue in a long ass answer. So you know, <laughs> we'll need three, maybe. Yes. Yeah, well, the problem was uh, in 1980, it's funny, I do have to say this. Twice this has happened in Chicago on a call in radio show that I was on when I was in Chicago, where people were actually incensed that I would name the organization Homeboy. And not because of, you know, the, the sexist nature of that, but because somehow they thought that was, I don't know what. I, I was always a head scratcher. Um, in California, you know, it's, it's kind of a neutral term, oddly. You know, people will say, hey, you know, uh, you know, do you know Mr. Gomez, the math teacher? Yeah, oh, that's the homeboy right there. You know, it's a way of saying, talking about connection. So you want to go in their door and go out another door. In 1988, it wouldn't have occurred to us, and again, I didn't put a lot of thought into it, but in 1988, the gang thing was a guy thing. It was 97% male. 31 years later, it's probably 99% male. Uh, so having said that, 40% of the folks who work at Homeboy are female. And the, and the reason is uh, we kind of expanded it to include previously incarcerated. So any male who works there is a gang member. But any female who works there has to at least uh, have been a, a felon in prison on parole or probation. But if we, we tried to say populate the homegirl cafe with female gang members, we wouldn't, have, we wouldn't have been able to do it. We've never been able to do it just because of the, the numbers. Um, so it's an odd thing, you know, because people will say, well, what about the women? And I go, yeah, I don't know what to tell you. It's a little bit like if you had a women's shelter for domestic violence uh, victims and somebody said, well, what about the men? And you go, yeah, I guess there are men out there, you know. But, but it's, it, you know, it's kind of, there's an intentionality to kind of deal with the issue as it's been handed to you, which was, you know, 97% male. So, but we have homeboy, homegirl merchandise, and we have homegirl cafe, and 40% are women. So just because in this day and age you can't, you can't not expand that way. But it's kind of we've lost a little bit of the gang intervention piece because we call ourselves a gang intervention rehab, meaning a healing place, and a reentry program, which then includes women. Yes. Yeah, the question is about replicating in other places in the country. Uh, in 2008, when we moved into our current headquarters, our fourth headquarters in Chinatown in downtown LA, um, that's when we started to get delegations. So the first one I recall was uh, a, a group of stakeholders from Wichita. And they said, couldn't you kind of basically airlift this into Wichita? And I remember we, we, well, we have to think about this. So we sat down and we thought about it. Do we really want to become, you know, the McDonald's of gang intervention programs, you know, with over five billion gang members served, you know? And, <laughs> and we kind of said, no, we don't, we don't want to do that because one of the things we think the reason Homeboy worked is because it was born from below. So if we airlifted Homeboy into Wichita, people would correctly say, well, what do you know about Wichita? I don't know anything about Wichita. So, so the delegation hung out there for like five days and they went back. And most places now start with a social enterprise. And in their case, uh, it was a thing called the Center Cafe. Again, the same model, same population. Uh, part of the idea, of course, is to have rival enemy gang members working side by side because you can't demonize somebody you know and it creates a disconnect out in the community. Uh, how can you be working with our enemy? That kind of thing. And of course, you know, he's not my enemy. He's my friend now. So uh, we offer what we call technical assistance. And so now we've started a thing in the last six years called the Global Homeboy Network. So there are 147 programs in the United States modeled on Homeboy and 16 programs uh, outside uh, the country. So we have uh, Rise Up Industries in San Diego and First Chance 
industries in Seattle and um, uh, Braveheart Industries in Glasgow. You know, they don't all have to, you know, say industries, but they, they seem to. And then we gather every August for two and a half days, what we call the gathering. So we get 400 people from all over the world, people who are our partners. And it was, we just check in with each other, and it's uh, best practices and workshops and big uh, plenary sessions to kind of... And so we all try to be on the same page in terms of the methodology that we believe in. So, Great. so the uh, magic wand question about what practices... Uh, to, to sort of enhance uh, the practice of tenderness and um, yeah I, I don't if I practice uh, you know I think there's the intentionality of uh, of paying attention you know Rumi is, invites us to live in the infinite moment when everything happens so you want to if you live in that place something magical happens you know a lot of times we think joy is is meant to be an outcome of our living when joy is really an outlook for our own life and it's how you see things how you how you approach things um, and so it's what uh, Dorothy Day uh, always called the duty to delight I think she was quoting Ruskin but it's it's the same principle if you can bring focus to bear right in the present moment because otherwise we're lamenting what happened yesterday and we're anxious about what will happen tomorrow, but we're, we're saved in, in, the, uh, in the present moment. Um, I, you know, I took uh, two homies, uh, Larry, an African-American gang member, and uh, Jose to Chicago in, uh, about three weeks ago, and uh, Jose had never been on a plane, and, and uh, Larry was like 41 and Jose was like 36 and combined they had spent a half a century incarcerated exactly 50 years and uh, so we were at Southwest and we were lined up in you know in the A group and and Jose's behind me and he has kind of a loud ass voice you know he says hey G can I turn my phone on airplane mode and I said, well, you know, you can use your phone now and even when you're on the plane, but the minute they close the door, you got to turn your phone to airplane mode. And he turns to a woman behind him, total stranger, I've never done airplane mode before. <laughs> and the look on her face was great, yeah. <laughs> but I remember thinking about it later that it was an invitation uh, to live in the infinite moment when everything happens. And that's the risen life. You know, I, you know, we just finished Easter, and I don't know, we, just as we settle for a partial God, we kind of settle for reenactment and commemoration, you know? Which, there's nothing wrong with washing of the feet on Holy Thursday or remembering the, you know, the Last Supper. I, I was on the 10 freeway, in LA on Good Friday and right above me on the overpass was Jesus with a crown and a beard and long hair carrying the cross, a big procession behind him. It's reenactment, it's commemoration. But the resurrection isn't about yesterday, it's about right this second. And the more you can be anchored in that infinite moment, you know, the better. I, I, again with Larry and uh, and Jose, and again, between the races, especially in prison, when they come right out of prison, it's tough because prisons are so highly segregated, at least in California. And so and you don't mix. And so here they are on this trip, and, uh, and we did six talks, you know, and, and at one point we had a free afternoon, and so I was prepared to hear go to Navy Pier and, and uh, come back to the hotel, you know, and Navy Pier has all these shops, I guess, and so I said, knock yourself out, buy gifts for your ladies, you know, and, and I gave money to do that, and so they, uh, they find this store, you know, the build a teddy or make a teddy or whatever the hell teddy, and you design your own teddy bear, and I guess you can say, well, make the teddy bear a nurse or something, I don't know what, and, uh, 
so Jose, they both got one for their ladies. Well, you, there, there's this thing where you can tape your, you can record your voice on the teddy bear. And then, uh, so they did. And then, so uh, Jose was showing it to, and you push the paw, and Jose had taped for his wife, I love you, baby, with all my heart. Come here, give me a kiss. <laughs> Do you think she'll like it? I go, oh my gosh, she'll love it, you know. And well, the next day, you know, you know, the homies they buy stuff and they, they hardly have any room left in their bag. So he pushes this thing in, <laughs> and with the with the zipper on his gym bag, and every time he put it down, I love you with all my heart, baby. <laughs> TSA. Oh, my favorite was shoving it to fit in the overhead. <laughs> Come here, give me a kiss. <laughs> oh my God, we were just crying. We were laughing so hard. So on the way home from LAX to uh, to back to the office, the Homeboy Industries, uh, Jose's in the back seat and he says, "Hey, G, you know what the best thing of this whole trip was? It was like four days." I said, what's that, son? He points at Larry, getting to know him. And Larry says, yeah, I feel the same. And somehow you're anchored in the infinite moment when everything happens. So he came to me the other day, and uh, he, Jose, he walked in my office and he said, uh, my dad died. I said, oh, I'm so sorry. He says, I haven't seen him. I hadn't talked to him in 25 years, except two days ago, somebody told me he was dying. He was deported long ago to Mexico, and I heard he was dying, so I called him. Hadn't heard his voice in 25 years. Then he tells me that when he and his twin brother are 11, they made a pact. They looked at each other and they said, when our father comes home tonight and he's drunk, and he starts to beat on our mom. Let's defend her. And they shook hands. And predictably, the father came home drunk. And as they had expected, he began to wail on the mom. And, and they dove on his back, and they pulled him away. And they wrestled him to the ground. And the startled father finally turned his rage on his two twin 11-year-old boys, and he just beat them bloody. And then he dragged them by the necks out to the sidewalk and threw them out on the sidewalk and said, you are dead to me. Don't ever come back here. And they didn't. They went and lived in a park two blocks away Jose told me that every night they'd pull a big old heavy trash bag out of the trash can and then they'd lean the trash can and these two 11-year-old orphans would slide in and sleep there in each other's arms. They went home twice and the mom would cook for them and wash their clothes until they learned that the father had discovered this and beat her all the more. And he had not talked to him in 25 years. And he said, I called him to say I forgive you. Because I don't want to carry that with me anymore. Then he shifts gears and big tears in his eyes. And he says, I'm enjoying the person I've become here. Like I've never enjoyed anything in my life. And I thought, enjoy is an odd word. It's a resurrection word. It's a right this second word. It's choosing to live in the infinite moment when everything happens. Thank you all very much.